Good afternoon. Uh, this is the Human Development and Leadership uh, Division. And today uh, we're going to have a webinar on your personal quality trainer, naming theory of profound knowledge applied to self-development. So our speaker, let me introduce our speaker, uh, uh, Richard, Richard Uphoff. He's a 23-year veteran of the financial service industries and is currently a manager and registered principal with the Vanguard Group in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. He is also a senior member of ASQ and a certified manager of quality uh, ASQ CMQ and quality engineer ASQ CQE. Currently he is also serving to ASQ Human Development and Leadership Division Leadership Board as a treasurer and uh, uh, with that, I would like to also uh, mention um, that Brooks Kader and myself, Deepak Biskitwala, will be moderate today's webinar. And we are requesting all our audience to hold off all their questions to the end of the webinar. And uh, we can have 10 15 minutes Q and A session. We will discuss any of your questions um, at that time. Yeah, sure, actually, Deepak, Deepak, they can, they can uh, type them in whenever they want, but we probably yeah. will not address them until the end. But if so, you, when they strike sorry, you, type, type it in. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll deal with it at the end. So, um, yes, Brooke. Uh, so, I, um, as Brooke said, you know, you can also type your question uh, in the question box and we will address this question at the end of this webinar uh, during the QA session. So with that, I would like to turn over to Richard. Richard, uh, it's your show, it's okay. your fine time. Okay, thank you very much Deepak and thanks Brooks and thanks to all of you. Welcome to this webinar and thank you for being interested in the work of the Human Development Leadership Division. We're very excited to be able to present this to you and uh, I just want to start by saying thanks to all of you for taking time to invest in your own development and for taking time to, um, to spend with us and learn a little bit more about these concepts and about our, our division, so thanks to you. Now before we get started, I am curious to know just where people are uh, dialing in from. So if you could, uh, this will also be a test of our, uh, our question feature uh, that Brooks and Deepak just mentioned, but we have about 29 or 30 attendees on the line so far. But if you could, just uh, type in your location. Where are you dialing in from? We'd be curious to hear where, where you all are uh, uh, calling in from. Uh, if the question box uh, doesn't work for you, then try the chat box and then we can go from there. It's working good. Got somebody from Dublin, somebody from Boston, San Antonio, Tallahassee, Houston. Okay. I'm guessing Dublin is probably our friend Lucas. So welcome, Lucas, if that's you. Madison, Wisconsin, Texas. Okay. Houston, Great. Well, Maryland, Trinidad and Tobago. That's right. Minden, Nevada. We should get a couple more here. Arkansas. Okay. okay, so U.S. very, very well represented. So again, thanks to all of you in all the time zones across the U.S. and overseas. Uh, thanks again for, for joining. So let me just start by, by sharing a story. And I'll just ask that you, uh, you imagine, uh, imagine this along with me. Imagine yourself, right? Um, that you have been working in a profession for a number of years, you've been trying to develop yourself professionally, and one of the goals you set out for yourself was to present some information at a, at a national conference. And this would require travel and development, and you were very excited to be able to offer this to people who would attend, attend this conference. And you were all geared up and ready to go, and you were prepped. You gone over your presentation many times and you were, you were ready. But you were also uh, in a new job at the time and you were so focused on 
licensing and certification requirements for that job that you were extremely busy uh, studying. And then one day at home on a Saturday, you're home with your uh, nose in your study material and suddenly you get a phone call that says, Richard, where are you? Uh, you are supposed to be here, your seminar and begins in 15 minutes and you are not here in Houston as you're, as you're supposed to be. Imagine how you would feel. Uh, this is in fact what happened to me and part of the backstory behind this presentation. And as you can imagine, you know, I felt horrible and you would have felt horrible too. Uh, and once I got over the shock and embarrassment of this lapse on my part, it really kind of told me two things, right? Number one, obviously, I'm still not as organized as I'd like to be or as maybe I thought I was. And number two, uh, I realize I'm still a procrastinator. There are a number of things I put off with my presentation to the last minute, uh, travel plans not being one of them, but unfortunately I didn't double check my travel plans. And uh, lo and behold, I uh, had made the travel arrangements, all the correct travel arrangements, but for the wrong weekend. And so I realized that you know, I still had work to do on my own development. So this is, this is our subject, right? This is what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to couch this in the, within the framework that Dr. Deming set forward a number of years ago around his theory of profound knowledge. And we're going to apply it in this concept of, of self-development. So this is what we're, what we're here to talk about today. And I'm actually going to... Um, uh, talk about, uh, I'll give you a little bit more about my background and how I come at this. Uh, and then I'm really going to focus on three specific subjects or three specific topics. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the problem and its context, problem behind self-development and some of the challenges. And secondly, we're going to talk about the solution and Deming's theory of profound knowledge as he originally envisioned it. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about the details and some possible solutions, and then eventually uh, get on to next steps. And I have a warning here at the bottom of my slide, you know, be, bear, be prepared for questions. Uh, not audience participation types of questions, but really questions uh, that I intend to plant with you so that you can take them back uh, to your own work, your own life, uh, your own position, and your own development. So these will be rhetorical questions I'm going to ask you to think about as we go through this material. And at the end of the hour, Hopefully we will have some practical uh, tips, practical applications that you can take back and, and use. So uh, those will be the three, three uh, topics, problem, solution, and then some details. So as I already mentioned, you know, I, I, I am a self-proclaimed procrastinator. And actually, um, you know, I've been labeled a procrastinator for a good part of my life, uh, actually since I, was, since I was very young. And this really started um, back in grade school. Uh, this is actually a copy of my second grade, second grade progress report from uh, Lincoln School in Downers Grove, Illinois. My teacher, Ms. Hokendorf, who, uh, by the way, I had a huge crush on when I was in second grade. But as you'll, as you'll see, Ms. Hokendorf made this comment to my parents after the second semester. Richard has shown great progress with his creative writing. He does an excellent job at it and seems to enjoy it. He also seems to be doing better in scheduling his time and in getting things done, although he does need to be reminded occasionally. So even way back in second grade, I was given this, uh, given this label, helped by my teachers, and then of course reinforced by my parents that I was a procrastinator. Jump forward a couple of years now, this is uh, my fourth grade report card. This is Seaborg, also at Lincoln School. She um, had, had this to say, um, a word of caution. Richard needs your help in understanding that long-term assignments must be dealt with from the beginning. He needs to make a survey of the assignments and plan ahead. I suggest this because of the way he works. His crash progress or his crash programs are not too good. And then she throws this in. I love this part at the very end. Otherwise, everything is fine. So she wanted to end it on a positive note. But still, it's this theme that Richard does not use his time wisely. And then uh, a little bit, uh, a couple years later, in eighth grade, my social studies teacher, Ms. Barnett, saying, uh, Richard got all of his book reports done and in on time. So I'm making progress, although in a while. Uh, and as you can tell by my opening story, it's still uh, not quite as, as uh, fleshed out as, as I'd like it to be. 
So uh, this is a label that's been placed on me from the beginning. And um, as I mentioned, it really started uh, back in back in grade school. Um, but I uh, here's the comment uh, actually uh, I've circled here. Um, but fast forward uh, 30 years. Uh, you know, taking Myers Briggs. I'm an INTJ. If any of you are familiar with the nomenclature of IN, uh, Myers Briggs, um, and uh, this um, assessment that you see, the color assessment on your screen, really is from a company called Personalysis. This was a uh, management uh, exercise that my company went through a number of years ago, where they got the managers together. You go through this online assessment, and you get this uh, readout. And it really is uh, it's a two has a twofold purpose. One is to uh, give you insight into your own personality and how you think about the world and then it's intended to be shared in a team setting so that you could then learn how to interact more effectively with others in your in your group and uh, for, with personalysis everybody does this a little different their assessment is color-coded and you have these three dimensions rational socialized and then instinctive and the instinctive is really sort of your core being your core person personality and um, I'm just going to highlight uh, what this says down here in my, my core uh, instinctive personality in that is Richard needs time to organize, develop understanding, and minimize risks. And the reason why I highlight that is because this focus on, you know, this is the way I'm wired. And it took 30 years for me to realize this, but I do realize now, and it was actually going through this personality assessment, that um, just because of the way I'm wired, the way I look at the world, um, uh, that I need time to think about things. And it was uh, really just a confirmation that, that um, I, this is how I'm wired and this is how, how I think about the world. And in part, this is the value that I bring to problems, to a team, but I have to also offset this with the need to take action, right? Because the blind side of needing time is that you are often slow to take action. So while you can often add value by taking time to really carefully and thoroughly think through things, uh, sometimes it, it, because you take time, um, you don't have a natural tendency towards action, and that's something you have to learn to kind of uh, offset that. So while I'm wired to ponder, I have learned over the years that I have to act. And that, how I say it now, you don't know that not everything is brain surgery. So, you know, so why am I telling you this, right? I'm telling you this really for two reasons. Uh, number one, you have your own labels. You have your own self-imposed limitations, and you need to know what they are. Perhaps these are things coworkers have told you, your boss has told you, your uh, parents or kids or family or spouse have told you. These labels, and so you need to understand what those are because those represent limitations. They represent blind sides, but they also represent represent opportunities. Um, and the second reason why I'm telling you this is really that you can move past them, right? It's through this self awareness, and that that you can learn how learn tools to to move past move past these these things. But but herein lies the problem, right? Herein really lies the problem, because how do you take action? when we're so busy. Uh, I've just sketched out uh, the Department of Labor just came out with their latest annual survey a few days ago uh, that assesses the American workforce and these numbers are essentially a confirmation of what was in that study. This is a study they've been running for many years now. Uh, the average worker in uh, the United States spends uh, about eight to nine hours either sleeping or get, getting ready to sleep. Uh, and again, these are averages. Uh, and then the average person in the country, full-time worker, spends about eight to nine hours um, either working or commuting to work and or commuting to work. So really that just leaves six to eight hours for everything else that's going on in our lives. Family time, time with your spouse, uh, school if you're attending school, uh, community time including time that we may spend with ASQ or on webinars such as this, time, and time for yourself, you know, other components, physical um, physical components of your own uh, being, you know, how you take time for exercise or if you have physical ailments or you uh, have physical disabilities, right, these take time or mean that you may need more time to accomplish certain things. Or if you want to take care of your health uh, and exercise, you know, this takes time. Or uh, emotional um, 
component of yourself and things that you do to maintain a stable emotional life, or in some cases not, um, or a spiritual life. If you're involved with a religious practice or have some sort of spiritual practice, you know, that takes time, right? That, and you only have, um, you know, a few hours a day, really, at the beginning of the day and the end of the day to engage in, in these other things. So, really, you know, who has time for self-development? And this is, you know, this is the crux of the problem. Really, we're so busy, and and I didn't even mention the fact that even though many of us are working eight to nine hours a day, a lot of us cheat and work um, at night when we get home, or maybe check email first thing in the morning when we get up. Check work email. So uh, that eight to nine hours working or commuting to work can often get stretched to ten or eleven hours, uh, which usually then comes out of either sleep time or uh, the other time. So. You know, when this is all said and done, really, who has time for self-development? Um, but this is the crux, right, of the issue because as leaders, we have to make time for self-development and we have to make time for our own development. And this is in, imperative on ourselves as leaders because, um, uh, as um, Kuzis and Posner said in, in their book, The Leadership Challenge, leadership development is self-development. Um, and, or as our uh, co-moderator, uh, my friend Brooks, likes to say, leadership is about character as well. So not only is leadership about self-development, it's about developing your own character as a person. Um, and then I have this quote here, you know, this plea from, uh, spoken from uh, Plato's Phaedrus, he's Socrates speaking. This is actually inscribed in the oracle at Delphi, uh, to know thyself. And, uh, and even as uh, ancient as you know, 2500 or 2400 BC, this imperative of knowing yourself has been a part of human, human civilization. And then finally, uh, this quote here from uh, Carol Dweck, whose uh, great book Mindset really sets forth the, this idea that you know, people have either a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. And depending on whether you have a fixed mindset, or a growth mindset can often dictate um, uh, your success in your endeavors. Uh, and the quote that I have here from Carol Dweck is, you know, the view you adopt for yourself profoundly affects the way you lead your, lead your life. And that view is either a fixed view or a growth view. So these are just some quotes to kind of get you thinking about, about our topic. Um, so, okay, here's the problem. If you've bought into the problem, uh, that's great. But you know, what do we do about it? We want this to be focused on action and on next steps eventually. So, so what do we do about this? Well, this is where Dr. Deming comes in because a number of years ago, Dr. Deming set forth his theory of, of profound knowledge. And when he set this out later in his career, he really uh, you know, originally created this as a kind of framework for leaders in any organization. And it was really a framework that was intended to guide thought and action of leaders within that, within that organization. So that's sort of the context out of which this theory of profound knowledge came about. And it was really four parts that Deming thought would uh, pretty much surmise um, anything that a leader might need uh, to, to guide how they would think about the work, think about the workforce, and then to be able to take action. So the first um, part of this is really a, a, an appreciation for a system. And in his original context, it was really to think of your organization as a system of, of dependent components, right? That all things are um, com comprised of systems, and you need to have an appreciation of that fact and the fact that there are components that make up that system, and you need to understand what those uh, components are and what the broader system is and what the limitations of that system may be. Secondly, um, he uh, wanted this theory of knowledge, really, and the theory of knowledge was really for leaders and managers in the organization to be able to differentiate between facts and opinions. Um, because as he saw it in his uh, work early in, or his early work in the 40s and 50s that you know, so much of management was based on so much of management um, philosophy and management direction, management guidance for a workforce was based on opinions rather than facts. And so he tried to, tried to change that through his knowledge of a theory of knowledge, really, that you have to differentiate between facts and opinions. And then a third knowledge of variation, and that is really why did something go wrong? 
Um, why did we not get what we expected? Why is there a difference between outcomes when things uh, theoretically may be under control or within control? Why do we still have variation in the process? And understanding, having a knowledge of that variation, how to even measure that variation is fundamental to this, uh, to this theory of profound knowledge. And then finally, psychology. Uh, that leaders need to have an understanding of psychology, a knowledge of psychology, and that psychology is the key to understanding people. Uh, so these are the four components, right? And as I mentioned, uh, that Dr. Deming really originally created these as a framework for leaders. And so what, um, what I did was really to say, okay, if we apply these to our own lives, um, each of these four components would, would apply equally as well. And so we're going to go kind of one by one through these four pieces so that we can uh, start to think about how they might apply in our, in our own lives and for our own development. So uh, the first one, appreciation of the system. So what are the systems in your life? Um, I've already mentioned a couple of them at the outset, but um, you know, it could be family, uh, most likely it's work, um, your community, which could be community involvement, could be, as I mentioned, organizations such as ASQ, um, could be your neighborhood. Um, there may be a system if you live in a, a gated community or a, an HOA type of community. These, uh, there might be some level of involvement that's required. Well, this is also a system. And then, obviously, the system that is entailed in your own self, you know, the physical, emotional, and spiritual components that make up your own being. These are all different systems that we have to think about. And then, possibly more importantly, you know, how are you, how are you balancing all these? You know, quite often, work dictates uh, a third of that balance, um, and family will often dictate another portion of that balance. But then, just the physical need for sleep often dictates um, a, a significant portion of that overall system. Um, and we have to understand how, how are those balancing one uh, against the other. Now, we talk a lot about this work-life balance, but there's also um, work-family balance, or work-community balance, or work-physical, emotional, spiritual balance. And we have to think about our lives in, in this way so that we can say, you know, at any given time, things may be out of balance, or if you're feeling um, stress or tension in, in one part of your life, um, maybe it's because you haven't been spending as much time with family and exclusively at work. Or in another case, if you are experiencing illness, potentially it's because you've been neglecting the physical component of your life system. Um, or uh, perhaps a spiritual component uh, in order to deal with stress and larger issues in your life, if, especially if you've experienced uh, a significant life passage, you know, marriage or birth or death of a loved one. Uh, these can often shift that balance um, away from some of these other components. And we have to understand how these interact and then also how we would like to have them interact. Um, I work for an organization um, where the average age is uh, in my department is uh, about half of my age. And so that introduces a different dynamic and a different notion of how uh, balance is brought between these different components. And you hear a lot about the uh, sociological and demographic differences between different generations and what that does not only to workforce but to other things happening outside of the workplace such as community involvement or uh, nonprofit involvement that you know some of these other generations, millennials or um, late baby boomers um, are having on, on not only the work-life balance, but the balance between some of these other systems. So you have to think about uh, your life in, in terms of this. And like I said, we often do, but we limit it to work and then everything else. Uh, whereas we need to you know, divide that everything else category into some of these other components to see if we are also achieving, achieving balance there. So, Secondly, uh, I'm going to change up the order here a little bit and, and talk about knowledge of variation. Right? So knowledge of variation. There are three, in my opinion, three key questions with knowledge of variation in terms of how they are applied to our, our own self-development and our own lives. And first off, you know, what is the difference between what I, between what I want and what I'm actually getting? So 
what do I want to get out of this project, this relationship, this, uh, in this, uh, you know, whatever endeavor, and and what am I actually getting? And you have to look at those differences. Sometimes they're in complete alignment that what you're hoping to get out of it is exactly what you're getting or more. Uh, but in other cases, there may be a big gap between what we hope to achieve from this uh, and what um, we're actually getting from our involvement in that. And you have to understand what those, what those gaps are. A uh, second key question, I think, is, you know, uh, is my behavior serving my goals? So this is where we start to get into um, taking ownership and responsibility of your own role in, in serving uh, your goals and what is the behavior that's behind that. Um, and uh, this is something that we talk about quite a bit in my, my current role uh, where we try to understand as, as we're processing work for our, uh, our investment clients, um, you know, our code of procedures say that you're supposed to be doing one thing or a young person in the organization may say, well, my goal is to be promoted to this next position or my goal is to um, uh, take a position in another department. Well, one of the first things I'm going to do as a leader of leaders in that situation is to say, okay, is the person's behavior aligning with what they're telling me their goals are? So if they have aspirations to be a leader, I would want to know how are they behaving today? Are they behaving like a leader today? Or if I have an employee or a um, peer who's coming to me saying, well, I really want to go to this department, I would say, okay, well, what are you doing to set yourself up for success in that interview process or with, that, with the leaders in that department? And so we have to understand, we have to ask ourselves, okay, is my behavior serving my goals? First off, that assumes you have goals and you know what those goals are. Secondly, you have to have the self-awareness to say, what is the behavior that I'm demonstrating and how is that behavior connected to those goals? Um, and so this takes some takes some self awareness, and it takes some of the question asking that uh, that we've talked about. Um, and then thirdly, um, it's the question of okay, what is the role of habit in my in my self development? And there's a great book that came out a few years ago called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And in that book, he talks about this Q routine reward loop. And he gives a number of he's a great storyteller, and he gives a number of really good examples. Very poignant examples um, where habits can often be counterproductive until you realize that every habit has behind it a cue uh, to a behavior. And that cue often sets in motion a routine, which is the behavior. And as a result of that routine, there is some type of reward. And so you have to break down this cue routine reward if you want to change that behavior. You know, we say that uh, the latest uh, research says that you know, it takes between 20 and 30 days, depending on the task or depending on the behavior, it takes about 20 to 30 days to, uh, to change a habit. Um, and it's because you're actually rewiring the brain to expect a different reward because of the cue and the routine that are behind that behavior. And so you have to really understand how this breaks down in your own life. Now I'm going to take you through an audience participation activity uh, real quick. It's very simple. If you are driving right now, I would suggest you not take your hands off the wheel. However, uh, what I'd like everybody to do is to just cross your arms. Just cross your arms uh, you know, as if you were cold or cross your arms as if you were trying to be stern. Just cross your arms. and take a moment to just think about how that feels when you cross your arms. Now, I would say cross your arms the opposite way. So if you do right arm over left, now do left arm over right or vice versa. Now I would say, you know, ask yourself, how does this feel? Now if you're like most people when I do this, it's going to feel kind of weird. Some people even struggle for a second or two to even figure out how to do that. Right? It's because when we normally cross our arms, uh, in front of our, our chest, um, we do it the same way so often that it has created a, a neural pathway, a firing of neurons in the brain that tells you that the way you cross your arms is normal. And then when you try to cross them the opposite way, now you've engaged a different set of uh, uh, neurons, a different neural pathway in the brain that tells you this is new because you have now new stimuli 
um, from the skin and from the muscles that were required to be engaged to you know, fold your arms the opposite way. Now you've engaged a, a different neural network in the brain to um, tell you that this is what you need to do. And it feels weird. It feels different. Uh, it's the same thing if you try to throw a ball with your non-dominant hand or you try to brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand. Um, these introduce um, new neural pathways in the brain that tell you, um, uh, you know, this is new and this is different. And, and what happens in that is that when you first do that, it's going to feel weird and it's going to feel awkward and it's going to feel uh, unusual. Um, but uh, the, and that's why most people stop, right? That's why most people revert back to the original habit because they can't overcome that feeling that oh, this is different, this is hard, uh, this is not easily overcome. But what science and what research has shown us is if you do that and throw the ball with your non-dominant hand, brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand, or any other behavior that way, if you do it enough, it'll start to feel more normal but you have to do it repetitively. You have to do it repetitively and to do Higgs point in his book you have to build in this Q routine reward loop in order to overcome that initial feeling of ooh this is different, this is hard. And so when we think about our own behavior uh, whether it's you know uh, uh, not getting in the habit of checking your email first thing in the morning or uh, not getting um, uh, diverted from your project by web surfing in the middle of the day or um, trying to change a pattern uh, with your morning commute, or how you interact with other people in the office or at home. You know, these all, and oftentimes these become repetitive behaviors that, um, that really uh, have to be overcome through uh, awareness of this Q-routine loop in order to be successful and in order to, you know, in some cases, uh, make sure that your behavior is serving your goals instead of having one of these habits uh, getting in the way. You know, if any of you have ever tried to stop smoking, um, this is a classic Q routine reward loop, uh, one that Duhigg cites in his book. But this is the kind of thing that you have to do. You know, you have to change that behavior and then repeat it over and over again in order to come overcome uh, that neural pathway and, and uh, fire that new set of neurons in your brain to tell yourself that this new behavior now uh, feels normal. So these are some of the things that you really need to take into consideration as you, as you go about assessing your own behavior and uh, asking yourself the question, okay, is my behavior um, serving the goals that I have set forth for myself? So um, one of, I'll just give you another quick example. Um, one of the things that I've instituted to overcome my, um, my uh, tendency towards procrastination and my tendency to, to delay a uh, long-term project, one of the things that I've done is what's called the Pomodoro Technique. And really all that's behind the Pomodoro Technique is a timer. All you need is a timer. Because the idea is um, at the beginning of a long-term project or at the beginning of any sort of task that you're dreading, what you do is you commit to doing it for only about 15 to 30 minutes. Anybody can pretty much do anything for just 15 to 30 minutes. And so the idea is to build some momentum, right? You say, okay, I really don't want to start this project, but I know that the first step is, you know, X. I have to write out the problem statement, for example. I don't really want to start there because it's a huge project. I know it's going to take me many, many weeks to do it or many, many hours to do it. But I know that that first step is to write that problem statement. So I'm going to time myself. I'm going to set a timer, and I'm going to commit to just focusing on doing that until the timer stops. And I usually set the timer for you know, between 15 and 30 minutes. But now that way, I've built up some momentum. I've even actually gotten some things done on my project. And it's a way of kind of tricking yourself into overcoming that uh, urge to you know, surf the web or read some new interesting article that I just came across or paying attention to some new book or some new uh, whatever in my environment. Um, uh, this is a way to, to overcome that with that Pomodoro technique. So that's a little bit about uh, the second knowledge of variation. Now let's go on to, to the third uh, component, and that is the theory of knowledge. Uh, and the theory of knowledge, the way I describe this, is it really constitutes kind of two key questions. Number one, what do I know about the world and people in it? And this is not just you know um, facts and figures about um, your, uh, your immediate world, your country, your city, your state, your village, your town not just so much those kinds of facts about the world, um, but really 
more broadly, you know, how how do I know what I know about the world? How have I come about gathering this information uh, and about the people in it? Uh, and then secondly, really, what do I know about myself? And what are my limits? What are my strengths and weaknesses? Um, there are a lot of examples out there today. I've listed a few of them here. Uh, there's Myers-Briggs, there's Gallup Strengths Finder, there's Personalysis, which I showed you earlier. Uh, there's uh, Realize2, which is out of the UK. Uh, there's something called Social Style, uh, which I just learned about recently. And there are, uh, I imagine, a number of others. If any of you were at the uh, ASQ conference uh, this year, one of our keynote speakers is a world expert on personality types, and you can read his, his book. Um, and at the end of this, if you send me your email, I'll send you a list of resources, including including that book that talks about personality. But, uh, but the point here is you need to understand how you think about the world. And like my uh, a story at the beginning and my kind of uh, awakening to my own habits and the way I think about the world, you need to understand how you think about the world. And the, the beauty of the internet today is that a lot of these tools are available for free online. You can find a, there's a free Myers-Briggs test that you can find online, which can give you the basics of what your four letter um, uh, code is. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, mine is INTJ. Um, but uh, there are lots of free tools available to really understand. And again, there are uh, a number of reasons why you do this. One is self-knowledge, and the other is to really understand how to interact with people. Uh, you need to understand what am I good at, what am I uh, maybe not so good at, what is a, uh, a learned behavior rather than a strength, because sometimes our um, our learned behaviors mask themselves as strengths because we've uh, been so used to overcoming them over the years. So a lot of these tests will help you help you differentiate between what's a strength versus a weakness versus a learned behavior. Um, so as I mentioned, there are a couple couple listed here, but this is um, you know one of the key components of of this self development is how do I think about the world? How do I what do I know about myself and my limits? And what do I know about how I think about um, other people in the world and myself in in uh, in the world, whether it's workforce, community, home life, or or whatever. Um, so this one obviously is about what I know. Uh, the the fourth and and final one really is about um, how I think. Right? And this is the knowledge of psychology. And this is the fourth and final component of Deming's um, of system. And, and that is really, you know, how, do I, how do I think? And how do I, um, and the psychology of change really goes, goes really along, along with that. Oops, let me go back here. Um, so how do I think? How do others around me think? What, a, what motivates me and what motivates others around me? And then also, you know, what's my learning style, right? Like, am I more of an auditory learner? Am I more of a tactile or visual learner? How do I best learn? Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a reader, uh, and reading oftentimes takes time. Um, you know, I have a 20-year-old son who is not a reader. He's a very much a person who needs to get in and try things out, right? Um, we bought a number of years ago an Apple computer, and he was on, on the computer, and um, the way I would um, come to the computer is I'd read the manual first, and I'd go through and try to understand, you know, what do I do first, what do I do second. The way he would learn how to use the computer, he would just sit down and start uh, hitting buttons and try to see what works because he had that kind of that tactile need to get in, try things out, get that immediate feedback of what works or what doesn't work, as opposed to my approach. My learning style is, you know, I got to read about it first and then try to go out and uh, go out and apply it. And so how, you know, how do you think about this? How do you come at the learning process? Because this will help you to understand, um, you know, how you can overcome some other issues, how you can get up to speed more quickly on some of your goals. And then uh, finally here, you know, how do I best deal with change? Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies done around uh, not only the grieving process, but also the change management and how they're not, uh, not entirely unrelated. Um, that people, when dealing with significant change, often go through the same steps as people who are uh, uh, grieving. And so how do, you deal with, how do you deal with change? How quickly do you move through that change, um, change spectrum? Um, 
And so these are the questions really that are, are behind this uh, knowledge of psychology and how you, how you learn. And as I mentioned, you know, theory of knowledge is about what you know and how you know it, whereas the knowledge of psychology is really about how do you think and um, how, how uh, you think about the world and how you think about your, yourself in the world and then also how you think and how you learn. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is, the, uh, this is the solution, right? This is the solution in the details of how we, how we apply this, right? So I, you know, started out talking a little bit about, you know, myself and, and summarizing, um, you know, how I got to um, thinking about Deming's theory of profound knowledge. And then I talked a little bit about this problem, right? And the fact that, you know, we all have, um, we all have this challenge of time. And time is, is something that we all, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. Nobody has more and nobody has less than 24 hours in a day. We all have to figure out how we get things done within the parameters of, of those 24 hours. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the solution I think was really Deming's uh, theory of profound knowledge, but with the details around how it's applied in our own situation. So lots of questions, right? Questions to get you thinking towards, towards the next uh, next step and questions hopefully to get you thinking about um, what you need to do personally to overcome whatever you've defined for yourself as, as a goal or an obstacle um, and what direction you want to want to take. And then really um, um, it's about, you know, I was, a, uh, I was a philosophy major in college, and one of the things you learn in philosophy is that the questions are more important than the answers. And asking the right question is often more important than getting at a clear answer. Um, because the answers often change, uh, but the questions are what really get you honed in on, on that direction. And so I've um, filtered questions all throughout this presentation really to get you thinking about um, how are these uh, concepts going to apply in your own situation for your own development and what you want to get out of uh, whatever it is that you have defined as important for yourself. And as I say, you know, if, if knowledge is power, then self-knowledge is, is dynamic. And because really at the end of the day, you know, you want to get better. That's why we belong to ASQ. That's why we engage in this way. That's why you've signed up for this webinar is because you want to get better. You want to learn some new things. You want to help uh, achieve your your goals, um, and so hopefully these concepts have have helped you help to do that. But uh, now the real work starts, right? The real work starts starts, and uh, it it really is uh, in these next steps. So you know, so where do you go from here? How do you turn these questions into actionable actionable steps for yourself? And there are. I think three keys really to to success. I've I've outlined them here. So let's kind of look at these one by one. So first off, you know, have a plan for development. Um, if you don't, uh, try to get one. You know, you can uh, go on and do an online search, do a Google search for self-development plan, and you'll come up with lots of different ideas, different formats. And if you click on images, if you're using Google and your search as your search engine, you can click on images and see templates that people have used for uh, for self-development plans. So if you don't have one, get one and make sure you write it down. Uh, because that's equally important. If it's just still up in your head, then um, it, you got to get it out of your head and get it down on paper because then it'll seem more real. And as we say in the lean world, it'll make that work visible. When you get it down on paper, it'll, it'll make that work visible. Um, second thing is, you know, make sure your plan is SMART, right? You, I'm sure you've all heard of this acronym SMART, right? Make sure that your goal is specific and measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. So make sure that when you do write that down, that you have some uh, specificity to it. Not, you know, I want to um, uh, lose 20 pounds. That's the example. Losing weight is an example that people often find easy to grasp because it's tangible, right? Um, but you have to have make it be very specific. You know, I want to lose 20 pounds by a certain time, or I want to lose 20 pounds in these following actions. Um, you want it to be measurable, right? So you want to be able to get some data that shows you how you're progressing towards your goal, right? You wouldn't get on the highway in your vehicle without uh, having a working speedometer um, because you need that speedometer to give you data that tells you how you are doing in relation to the speed limit. 
So with your goals, you need to have data, you need to have a measurable goal that tells you um, what's the data that I'm gathering so that I can gauge my progress. Um, you want it to be achievable and realistic. Um, I sort of see these going hand in hand. Uh, you don't want to have, even you know, you've heard about these, um, you know, people setting goals that are wildly optimistic and uh, and unrealistic, but because oftentimes it's the journey that's more important than the destination. Well, I think in terms of our own self-development, we need those achievable and realistic goals to help us uh, gauge progress. And then finally, you know, make sure it's make sure it's timely, because um, you you, you want to you don't want to cut yourself any slack um, depending on the goal, uh, so that you can achieve it um, and and measure your uh, advance towards your goal in a timely fashion. And then and then thirdly, really, you have to follow through, right? Like how well did I do? Um, how well did I execute? And and like we say in with 5S, you know, the most important of the 5S's is, is that last one, and that is sustain. Um, you know, I did, a, uh, I did a 5S project in my own garage because, you know, I wanted to learn about 5S. Uh, I didn't have an opportunity to do it at work, so I decided to do a 5S in my garage. And I took pictures along the way to document. Uh, you can see those very soon on my blog. Um, but the fifth S is always the most important because now two years after I did that 5S project, things are starting to creep back into my garage, making it messy again. And so sustaining your gains, sustaining your improvement, sustaining your advancement towards your goal is just so critically important. And you can't do that if you don't have data and you don't have these periodic check-ins with yourself. Um, or recruit somebody else, recruit a peer or recruit your boss, uh, somebody else to hold you accountable to to those goals and to help you uh, sustain over time, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, again, as I mentioned, we, we are here to get better. We are here to improve. We are here to help our organizations get better. We are here to help our families and our personal lives get better. And it's through some of these tools that, that we can do that. But you have to think about the labels that have been placed on you um, because you can change. You can overcome them. Um, so in in closing, um, I would just like to say, you know, please connect with me. Uh, I'm on Google Plus. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I have a blog on Google's Blogger uh, called the Lean Leader Blogspot.com. So connect with me. And if you connect with me and you mention that you um, have uh, attended the webinar, um, I'll send you a list of some of the resources just so you can go directly to them. There's enough information in the slides here um, to. Uh, point you in the right direction online, but if you want to get the list of resources uh, and you connect with me or, or through the HDNL uh, website at HDNL um, uh, online, then you can uh, also connect with me that way. But if you connect with me, I'll send you, uh, send you that list of resources to help you, help you on your way. So with that, let me just stop and say thank you again for attending. Thank you for your attention throughout the time. And I guess uh, Deepak and Brooks, we're going to open it up for questions. Thank you, so, Richard. Um, so Richard, uh, um, it was a very good presentation. Thank you for that. I have a few questions um, that people have asked here. Uh, the question number one, um, that how can we get the copy of your presentation or your handout? OK. We'll, we'll post yeah. that on the, on the division website. Okay, so yeah, as Brooks mentioned, um, the slides will be available. The webinar will be available on um, on the website. So check uh, check in on the website in a few days, and uh, and it should be out there. Um, other question, um, um, person named David uh, David has that uh, he's very interested in the person analysis, personalities, and yes. how can we get how, what kind of book you have used. Because um, on your presentation, you had seems like uh, you you got the picture of the person 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 analysis. So yes, where can we get it? How can we get it? People are very interested in that. Uh, can you share some information about that? Sure. Um, I I don't have a lot of information on person analysis. I think you can go to their website personalysis.com. Um, but I'm not positive on that. But basically, how it was presented to me is was given. Uh, I was asked to participate in this through my 
uh, a job prior to where I work now at Vanguard. So this was a kind of a team building activity that the entire management team at my former company went through. Uh, so uh, the way it was set up was you were given some materials ahead of time, you were given a link to their website, you had to fill out a self-assessment, answer a number of questions, and then a, a paid facilitator would come in from personalysis um, and then help uh, a look at the collective results. You got a nice packet of information um, that explained all your different results, explained the different components of it, and then um, the facilitator would come in and then talk about different dynamics, different dynamics of the group. You know, strengths and weaknesses of the collective personalities within the group, um, extremes, you know, highs and lows, uh, and then really give us. Uh, and he facilitated a one-day workshop, which really gave us a glimpse into how to interact more effectively. So you got that initial kind of self-assessment um, and then some uh, you know, tips on how to think about how to interpret your own results. And then in, in my case with my uh, former company, um, this facilitator came in and then talked, okay, how do you take your results and interact more effectively as a team? Uh, Richard, this is Marilyn. I just uh, went online and indeed there is personalysis.com uh, uh, where you can uh, get all that information and order a analysis if that's what you'd like to do. Yeah, and like I said, you know, there are so many of these available. Some are for free online, some are not. Once you have looked at a lot of these, uh, each have slightly different flavors. You know, I've seen other, I just saw one at the uh, uh, World Conference in Milwaukee where it was, uh, I guess, a DISC model, D-I-S-C, which also used similar color coding. So, you know, the point is there's a lot of different models out there. If you don't want to spend the money, there are a number you can get online for free. Uh, some require an investment of time and money. Others, uh, others not so much. Richard, here, here's one. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad somebody asked this. Uh, you started the presentation take, talking about procrastination and organization skills. What tools have you used to improve these facets of your life? <laughs> uh, that's a great question, uh, and I would say it's a work in progress. Um, you know, I just actually recently picked up a book called Personal Kanban or Kanban, depending on how you pronounce that, Personal Kanban. Uh, it's a great resource, and it was actually an idea that I got out of attending the World Conference in Milwaukee because um, uh, a couple of the sessions that I, talked, uh, that I attended talked about this concept of Personal Kanban or Kanban. And so what I've done at work is, at least to help me stay organized with my work projects, is um, you know when you get the book, you can, again, go online, just Google Personal Kanban, and you'll be directed to uh, a couple of different resources, including the book, um, but the book really spells out one way to do it. So that's you know the way that I'm currently uh, trying to stay on on top of it. But I have to admit, because of you know, you know, I'm a reader, I'm a learner, and uh, I am a con it's a constant struggle. And I'm a tactile learner too, so I, I have a hard time reading things online. Uh, so I have to print it out, have it in my hands. Uh, I still read an actual newspaper every morning um, because I just like to have those four square feet of print, newsprint in front of me. I can scan the, scan the headlines. I can go in depth very quickly. So it is a constant battle. And if you were to ask my wife, it's, you know, uh, something that, um, you know, we're constantly talking about how I can, you know, organize my piles, organize my books. So, um, but yeah, you know, if you, uh, if you reach out to me, I can give you some more specifics. Uh, some things that have helped me to get a bit more organized, but like I said, it is a, an ongoing, ongoing battle. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I have another question uh, for you. One of our attendees asked this question. How do we try to change an already existing business culture that would rather use follow status quo rather than a continuous improvement culture? Yeah, you know, that's a big question. That is a big question. How do you change a culture and get people out of sort of results now uh, and think about things more broadly and get more of a continuous improvement mindset? That, that is a big question. And um, it's, it's a tough nut to crack, I'll say. Um, you know, I'm dealing with it um, myself, uh, you know, at, at Vanguard. Vanguard has a very formal, very structured quality program, um, but yet people, um, will often get caught up and hung up in the terminology 
and the um, the structure and, and not think about the fact that you know uh, there are real ideas for real change and real progress so I'll just mention one kind of quick tip which has helped me but again if you reach out to me I can point you to some resources um, talk about again remind me of what the question is if you reach out to me and then I can point you to some resources that um, have been helpful for me um, uh, but um, uh, the thing that I'll mention is um, you know, never underestimate the power of passion around some of these topics. Right? Never underestimate the power of enthusiasm and passion. So it's the enthusiasm and the energy and the passion oftentimes that you bring to the problem, that you bring to your interactions with your peers or with your bosses at work that helps change move the dial a little bit right when people see that you are enthusiastic and passionate about these things and you know you see and you show them how it can help them get better how it can help them reduce costs how it can can help them reduce waste how it can help them make money or how it can help them solve problems I think once you show people actual tangible results even in small ways um, that can you know, you build on that. You right. You gain momentum on that. I'll give you one quick example. Um, I recently took uh, my team leaders through a gamble walk exercise. They had never done it before. Right. We went through one building on our campus, made some observations, went through our own department, made similar observations, and uh, one of the things that we noticed coming out of that was um, a piece of carpet, a filing cabinet, had been removed, and uh, or had been moved and it revealed uh, a place on the carpet that had never been completed and so the bare concrete floor was exposed well it had been that way for weeks if not months and we had just sort of mindlessly walked past it day in and day out well it wasn't until I said hey let's do this gamble walk let's make these observations that they looked at that through uh, fresh eyes and they said gee you know gosh darn it I'm gonna fire off that email to the facilities coordinator and say you know we need to get this fixed uh, nobody had ever done it, and yet we walked by it every day. So it's those kinds of things in small ways, small victories that can often help uh, change the tide. What are the five S's? You gave us one. We need four more. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So the five S's. Um, first one is um, uh, sort. Right. So the first thing you do in in the five S process is you is you sort. Right? You try to figure out um, everything that is out there and try to see everything. Right? Again, watch my blog. I'm going to start posting my 5S project from my garage so you'll see this kind of in uh, graphic detail on my blog. But first S is sort. Second S is set in order. Right? There's a place for everything, so set everything in order. Uh, third S is shine or sweep. Right? Clean things make them presentable, right? fix things, repair things. Uh, fourth S is standardize. Right? In order to maintain the gains that you've achieved, you have to standardize. That's where the organize comes in. The organization often comes in is through that uh, fourth S of standardize. And then, of course, the fifth S is, is sustain. That was good. He passed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, one more thing, I think one of our audience mentioned about, you talk about the smart and what you talk about what is S means, M means, A means, but what is R means? Oh, R is really realistic, right? Like the S is specific, M is measurable, A is achievable, R is realistic, and then T is timely. So I kind of see achievable and realistic going hand in hand. Um, but you know, realistic really, you know, um, says, hey, you know, is this realistic for the context for the goal? Um, is it a realistic uh, and and achievable goal? So I sort of look at them as synonymous, but the R is realistic. There's there's an advocate here for reliable. Reliable, um, yep. Okay. Can That's you reliably or and reasonably expect to accomplish the objectives of the plan? Yep, that's another another good one. And you see, when if you just Google smart goals, you'll see slight variations in the terminology. Um, but typically, the ones you'll see more often are are these uh, five that I just spelled out. Oh, and the other thing, just with that, is you know, don't be afraid to change it, right? Like if you don't like R as realistic, you know, change it to reliable or change it to 
um, you know, something else that is more meaningful to you uh, because that will help, again, with that sustainment, right? Because it's now personalized and customized to you. Um, you know, don't get hung up on you've got, it's got to be this way or that way. Just change it. If you don't like it, just change it. Well, I think we're about there. Deepak? Okay. So uh, the last question I have, Brooks, for our audience is how do they, how do they will get continuous education credit for this webinar? Uh, we will send it. Um, we we get a uh, participation list. We will send you a a letter that can, contains a or an email that contains a link to a survey and awards your uh, your continuing education points. You get point one for the webinar. Thank you, books. So, audience, do you have any other question? Um, please uh, send us email at you know our uh, uh, human development and leadership uh, website. Uh, Brooks and I or anyone can answer that question, uh, or you can contact Richard uh, to his LinkedIn or blog, and you can get more information about this webinar. Uh, again, thank you very much for your time, and see you next time for the new webinar.